This is The Future Of, where experts share their vision of the future and how their work is helping shape it for the better. Hi, I'm Jessica Morrison. With the festive season upon us and Australians believed to have just spent $5.4 billion on record Black Friday and Cyber Monday sales, what is it that actually encourages us to spend? To answer this question, we thought it would be a good time to revisit one of our favourite episodes, Understanding Consumers, to remind ourselves about the tricks behind the brands. It'll be the first of three episodes that we'll be re-releasing as we take a break over the summer holidays. In this episode, my former co-host David Blaney was joined by Associate Professor Min Tay and Dr Luke Butcher from Curtin University's Faculty of Business and Law. They chatted about the technologies employed to track consumers and whether millennials and Gen Z are more savvy about marketing than previous generations. If you'd like to find out more about this research, you can visit the links provided in the show notes. Min, you recently did some research on a, a headset which tracks consumers' emotional state when they're looking at an advertisement. Is that right? Uh, well, it's not just a headset. Um, it's actually a combination of various um, devices that can track and understand consumers' behaviour in, in terms of their skin conductance, facial expression, uh, and also um, and, um, eye gaze. So it's actually a combination, a suite of devices. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, gee, that's a bit creepy, isn't it? Or, or is it? Uh, well, I would we get ethics approval. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is right. Yeah. We're ethically approved. Um, actually, you'd be surprised. A lot of um, uh, shopping technologies and retail environments have integrated these uh, these technologies, um, especially uh, when you talk about people's facial recognition. I don't think it's something entirely new. Um, and so you can see that how that translates into other aspects of businesses these days. And what did you learn from that research? A lot. <laughs> and I think one of the things that we learned is that what people say and what they think they know about themselves and how they articulate it verbally isn't quite so true when you actually test them based on their psychophysiological responses. So um, there, there is a bit of a contrast there. So, for example, if I, if I was to say, oh, I... You know, I'm not a cheapskate at all. I go for sort of expensive things. But then as soon as I see like a, you know, like a $2 uh, mobile phone or something like that, I start getting like sweaty or something like that. <laughs> you get really That's excited. an extreme example. But well, you, you're probably right with that example, heart rate actually. Increases. <laughs> yeah. Your yeah. heart rate increases. You see and, like you know. a cheap flight somewhere, you just immediate response would be that you're going to click on the button. And I think it's also the, the thing where you might not recognize it yourself, but essentially your responses will tell you otherwise. And you'll probably get excited, heart rate increases, and you know, you might actually act on it, even though you say you might not. And do you have any examples from this? Um, one of the things that we did was uh, with a store, uh, we actually uh, had consumers walk through a um, simulated store, Gabriel Chocolate, uh, and what happened was when people went in, um, when they saw, we were thinking, you know, they would be more triggered by all the other elements like the packaging and all the other store atmospherics, but when they saw cookies, immediately their heart rate went up. And so that was something that was unexpected, and it's probably hard to tell people or ask people, oh, what really captured attention, mm -hmm. but actually those cookies make a big difference. And what was that? Um, I guess one of the things is that cookies have a sensory element to it. So not just visually, it, it does make people get excited because, you know, people can start to imagine what it tastes like. But more importantly, the waft of the smell as well. You know, it does, it does trigger a lot of other um, associations where people think, oh, this is going to taste good. This smells good and actually creates an atmosphere which might be homey, cozy and welcoming. It smells like childhood. Yeah, <laughs> Luke, you're exactly right. Luke, you were just about to add something. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that um, we've used this research in the user experience space as well. Um, a lot of the purpose with it is it's not necessarily around like a polygraph machine trying to tell someone telling the truth. It's usually around things around measuring attention or interest, uh, emotional response and things like that. So there is a certain amount of emotions or a certain type of emotions that fit those profiles. For example, it might be surprise or things like that that um, are being through evaluating the different metrics of the skin conductance or whatever it might be, or the heart rate, or um, and then aggregating that with eye tracking or things like that, facial recognition, you start to form a sort of an idea um, and hopefully something a bit more objective about what the uh, the participant is 
observing and what they're engaging with and the response that they're getting. So it's not really like a give them a question though and we'll go, oh, you're lying or anything like that. Um, but certainly trying to understand where their attention is being drawn is quite important as well. Um, and we've used that in a lot of user experience research as well and doing testing of apps and websites and things like that as well where we can start to see where are people looking, where are they paying attention, where are they starting to break their attention, where are they sort of struggling perhaps to sort of um, follow the with a particular task that they've been given to undertake. So it's just a really a much more objective measure than a self report measure like a survey or something like that. Mm -hmm. When does it, um, do you think there's there's perhaps a bit of a, a, an ethical line being crossed when you're looking at you know, people's sort of biological responses to things? They're all or? participants, yeah, that are agreed. Like there's nothing particularly sensitive that's being done with it. Um, it's more around, like we said, if they're evaluating as a research participant who's been a part of the process and is, we've received ethics approval for, if you're taking them into a store where you're starting to get an idea about where their attention's being drawn to certain things and their eye gaze and things like that. So, I mean, I don't think there's necessarily any ethical issues with that sort of stuff, but certainly there could be with some stuff. What if like your, your local Coles, for example, had all those Kinect cameras that can tell your heart rate? I, I wouldn't say like... if, yeah. When? Oh, if? Yeah. <laughs> when? Okay. If they don't already, yeah. Well, when? Do you think, do you think that was then maybe? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if, but that, if that's, you know, people haven't um, given uh, consent to be a part of that, then absolutely. Okay. Um, but, you know, these people are all, they know what's going on. They're being remunerated. Um, and at the end of the day, like, there's no personal data being captured or anything like that. Um, it's all used in an anonymous or at least pseudonymous form. Um, so there's no real, yeah, I don't think there's any issues with it. And nor do the ethics approval people once you get it through appropriately. So. So I suppose one of the things that people might find contentious is that how when we roll it across a large scale and from a, a commercial perspective, what would people feel about it? Um, there's always been a lot of discussion about a bit of an invasion of privacy. You don't really want people to know how you feel under the skin. Um, and I think that's one thing that can you know, people have been reactive around that, especially, you know, we talk about things such as facial recognition. Yeah. From a commercial perspective, people do feel that, you know, do I really want my faces to be recognized and how I actually think and feel and how I, you know, my gazes are tracked. Um, so I think that's the thing. From a research point of view, we do make sure that all these things are being covered from, you know, and it's kept confidential as nothing to be used for commercial purposes. People seem worried and then they go and use a face swapping thing on social media that then provides all, you know, like, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think these things are the things we should be too worried about, but there's certainly a lot of things in that space we should be worried about. Well, I guess it's the, the, the old um, question, would you, want, uh, would you want a bitter X to know? Would you want ASIO to know? I don't have anything to hide, so. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, <laughs> well, I guess it has its benefits, like whereby you can use it for, um, for what's that called, transactional purposes. So there are devices or technologies that have allowed that for people to track their facial recognition, so that it helps them ver verify that they are who they are when they make payments. So it yeah. does have its convenience if it's done and used properly, I suppose. Yeah, I think the bigger issue is the the laws for the companies that are getting that data. That's for right. example, all these, uh, whether it be your, your thing on your phone, your thumb, um, or facial recognition thing. Yes. With what we're doing with that data isn't necessarily anything that could, um, well, I, I hope that wouldn't be seen as being unethical, but certainly some of these other companies that are um, extracting all that data in the name of security or whatever it might be, convenience, um, I think that's probably where the real and Certainly Europe should be have been doing a lot better in this regard than we have. Are we becoming, are we as consumers becoming a bit more cynical, a bit more discerning when it comes to marketing? What, what methods are working and uh, what, what's on the way out? Oh, that's a big question. Consumers? It is a big question. <laughs> Discerning, definitely. Savvy, definitely. And I think people do. Um, I think a lot of the time people want to be able to build a bit of trust and credibility with the company, or well, the company has to do that. And that is the biggest question here, because full disclosure is not often um, you know, apparent. And I think um, consumers tend to feel that, you know, how do I get that? And how do I build that trust? And whether I can trust this company, what they're saying is it actually true. Um, so that's one of the biggest challenges here. Uh, in terms of what is big in marketing, well, that is almost like... It's, a, it's, it's big it's in a, the world. It's yeah. bigger than the world, yes. And I guess because there are so many different groups of consumers, you would expect different strategies work for different groups of people. Yeah, I mean, I, I think people are probably a little bit apathetic towards the things that are actually going on um, with their, if we're talking about the issue of data particularly. So, I mean, I think some are more sophisticated and perhaps a little bit more conscious of what's happening and what can happen with their data and how they go about managing that. Um, but certainly I think the general population is probably not quite aware of what's happening with it. Um, and generally there's the trade-off of we'll give you something fun or convenient and in return 
you know, don't ask any questions about this. So I think that's going to start at some point within the next few years, start becoming a bigger issue. But you did mention Europe before, and obviously be things like the GDPR, they're starting to um, regulate those things a little bit better. And I think we'll see the same thing happening with social media sites as well, because they've sort of acknowledged now that they can't do it. So the government's going to have to regulate them. Well, I think capacity. you're right about that because I think a lot of the trust and credibility comes when, when they have to sign something and mm -hmm. essentially provide that much data in, in return for maybe a product and service. I don't know if people actually feel that is there's a big trade-off, too big for them to actually derive much pleasure from mm -hmm. a, consu a consumption scenario. So, yeah, it's a big question. You know, I think a lot of the time we are selling our data for in, 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 in return for some sort of service and, and, and product. I'm not sure if people are aware of that and whether people become cynical as a result of that. And we always see scams and spams everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that really makes people think a lot deeper into, you know, how we're traveling and tracking in terms of marketing. And in terms of the, I guess, advertising campaigns as well, are there any, any particular types of ads that we can't really, can't really fall for? Sort of, you know, banner ads on websites or endorsements by celebrities? Yeah, I mean, I think there's things changing in that space as well. In the last few years, we've seen social media with influencers start to have to say this is a paid or a sponsored post, so people are becoming a bit more aware. Um, they're changing laws, I think, in Canada where they've done it with uh, removing the likes and things from, I believe, Instagram to sort of encourage people. Facebook's done that as well. Actually. Yeah, they're Facebook as well. Okay, cool. Um, to try and, yeah, address the issues around self-esteem and some that people are having an addiction to these platforms where the the likes become, you know, a, a metric of something that it just doesn't really mean. Um, so I think there's a lot of things happening in that space. But yeah, it's marketing is an interesting industry in that it sort of sits within society and culture. So it, usually the things that, uh, and also being self-regulated as well, um, once things get to a critical point or a tipping point where it's no longer considered acceptable in society, that's generally when things start to happen in the industry and changes start to happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's such a, every business in the world is practicing marketing in some way. So that it's very hard to get like a uniform response from people or, or change things. I think one of the things is the question of whether uh, what, what marketers are doing or businesses are doing is actually providing value to consumers in the society. I think that's a big, that's a big point. At the end of the day, it's not just about profits and dollars, but again, is it actually meeting consumers' needs and actually giving them what they want and identifying those things that make their life easier? But that is, you know, mm -hmm. that how do you balance that is the question. And yeah. I think consumers um, may or may not really know what they are really looking for. And I guess that's where you see a lot of uh, data collected or information collected from consumers to create something that they might want mm -hmm. and that they might need and that might actually make their lives a lot easier. And I guess that is the part whereby, you know, where it fits into culture and society and really providing value for people. Luke, in the, uh, in the video games industry, there's always a bit of a, a delicate balancing act catering to your, uh, I guess, your loyal fan base. Your it's one word for them, yep. Capital G gamers, and yep. apologies if we get letters for this, and uh, also, also breaking new ground. How's this been going? We've had, we've had some pretty, pretty bad shockers recently, haven't we? Yeah, I, I was certainly told by somebody who's big in the industry that her perspective was that uh, the, the old saying that usually when it comes to new technologies or new things in, in culture, they're first broken through video games and porn. And I think we tend to see that happen now with AR and things like that. Um, obviously, we've come through the Pokemon Go era and all that sort of stuff. Um, things around microtransactions and other things like that. Um, it was certain, crazy when just everyone was at King's Park yeah. like, on a weeknight. It was just On Fraser Avenue, there were just crowds of people playing the game. Hopefully interacting with each other, but also, yeah, staring at a phone screen. And <laughs> that was fun. But yes, I did interrupt you there. No, no, that's all right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think there's a, we generally see a lot of these new trends move through those industries uh, because that's where we get a whole bunch of people together and they're very passionate people um, and they're generally on the cutting edge of uh, technology or whatever it might be. So, yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing, obviously, VR was the big thing last year, particularly leading up to Christmas. It seems to have probably dropped a little bit down. Um, but, yeah, certainly... Yeah, video games have, are going from strength to strength, particularly in the mobile space um, and also social media space. C can you think of any any games, any titles recently which have um, done a very good job at uh, at annoying a lot of people? 
I think there's always that divisiveness depending on if it's seen as like a, a triple A game or like a big, uh, that's probably more like a, a more mainstream game from a large development studio. Um, so Fortnite's probably the biggest one over the last couple of years that's really come and got massive and sort of moving towards the esports world. Um, but then there's always the, the sort of the niche stuff and there's still the diehards that are still doing the esports and then there's the games that slip past most people where they're generally probably seen as the more, um, whether it be artistic in terms of seeing video game development as an art. Um, but yeah, I mean, that divisiveness always exists. Once the noobs get on board, such as myself, it sort of becomes a point of contention for all the, the gamers who are the diehards who are, you know, discovered this game many years ago, well, many moons ago or, um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that Fortnite's probably the biggest example of it. Are there any brands for you which, which stick out as being particularly in touch with their customer base? They really know how to market them and to flog stuff to them, to sell stuff to them. What do you recommend? I mean, I think in the world of digital stuff, particularly where everything is so segmented, like what I'm going to see or what I'm going to be exposed to through digital communications will, will be different to everybody else. So it can be hard to see, to sort of look into that and see what's happening. Um, but I, I always think that probably the bit, still the best example for me of like a big mainstream brand would be something like Ikea. I think just does it so well and knows their market and knows how to manage the supply chain and just do the whole customer experience from end to end so well. But what about you, Min? Oh. Use cheap food to trick you into buying furniture. It gets you to stick around, doesn't it? <laughs> that's right. That is actually, yeah, that's the whole experiential part of it. Um, I would have to say um, companies such as Netflix, Spotify, um, to a certain degree, Zara, for example. I mean, a whole consumer culture created around chill and Netflix. I mean, how, yeah, could, yeah. You, how could you deny that it has a, a great impact? So I think they really understand their customers. And I think part of it is also because they understand the, uh, what comes through and a large part of their business is built around um, analytics and mm -hmm. taking that information and actually creating value for customers based on what they watch, uh, what sort of genres they're interested in. And again, um, you know, using that to create new products that they roll through their, their platforms. And we're in a golden age of companies being highly successful and, and uh, providing great products and losing billions of dollars every year. So oh, Netflix being one of those. Perfect example. <laughs> yes, it is. And the Ubers of the world and the like. and you know, Movie passes of the world where a bunch of rich investors took us all out to the movies. Well, took a bunch of Americans out to the yeah. movies. So it's great for us it's as great. consumers. It's great. We're getting really we a great it. price yeah. and <laughs> great. eventually like the bubble will burst. Ama this amazing wealth transfer. Yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant. And can you think of any, any examples of uh, companies which have just been bad at, 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 um, at understanding what their customers need and want? Don't say EA. No, no. Uh, I'll, I'll move away fruit. from that side. But I think that there's, there's bad and like often what we see is that when you're trying to do something effectively for one group, sometimes it puts off other groups. So I think some that come to mind for me would be like betting apps and things like that, that a lot of people would say what they're doing, the way they go about their, their businesses and things is wrong, but they are highly successful. And within those particular crowds, um, you know, they do, they do certainly uh, make the impact that they're trying to make, which does piss off other people, um, which is sort of the point of it. So yeah, I mean, I, I think you've got to always look in segments and look within clusters of people and what, who they're trying to reach. Um, or just see the businesses that go out of business. They're the obvious ones, but yeah. Um, I would say um, more challenging, I think, would be in the grocery sector. There's a lot of competition. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that people do is like, all right, we're just going to do price cuts and everything. I think slowly but surely, um, people just remember them for being cheap, yeah. not necessarily for value. And you can sooner or later see these brands start to struggle. Um, and they might get phased out as a result. So I'll, I'll say... Wait, are you going to see Aldi getting phased out? <laughs> oh, no, Aldi does provide value, I have to say. <laughs> um, not an endorsement, by the way. Not a paid no, 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 no. Just, just a fact. <laughs> but yeah, um, I mean, they say that they're a good difference. So how can you deny? How could you argue with that, you see? When you compete on price, it's always... Yeah. And, so well, sort of che cheap with value versus cheap and nasty. Um, cheap and cheap. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to be just recognized as cheap. I think that, that even, you know, you can compete on price, but there's still value. Uh, but if you're just cheap and cheap and you start to lose, you know, the, the whole purpose of why. And again, it's in a very competitive environment. It's very difficult to sustain just based on pricing alone. Particularly in Perth. In Perth. Smaller Perth. economy, harder to move goods over here. And, you know, if it all becomes about cost, then yep, very it's challenging. It's challenging. How are companies using technology and uh, data in new ways to attract customers and to, to get money, to get sales? 
in any good ways because I don't know new ways. <laughs> But uh, oh, oh, it can be in good or bad ways. I'm sure they've got new ways every single day. They're thinking up some new trick to, whether it be the yeah. What's the latest yeah, yeah. trick? The, the big ones on social media seem to be like the, the image aging pictures or all that sort of stuff. You know, take show us a couple of pictures of yourself, and then um, we'll give you a picture of what you're going to look like in the future. But in the meantime, they're just training their algorithms to to do facial recognition or uh, pattern recognition stuff. So I think that's. Again, that comes back to what I was saying before about we just give someone something Click small, on like all a little the road bit of fun signs or, to prove that you're not. Yeah, robot. exactly. Those captchas are, are a great way to do it and uh, train all these algorithms. So that's a big trend at the moment, I think, in the the world of AI. Um, mm. That sort of yeah shift towards acquiring as much data as possible. Yeah, I suppose data is the thing that um, businesses, brands are really hoping to get their hands on because that's mm. really the value of a lot of things and how they can use that data is another point. Yeah. And uh, I mean, sh sh I think a lot of us would probably, the, you know, when we go to a website, first thing is you put in your details. That is one of the ways where data gets tracked. And I think you're giving data relatively freely for maybe 10, 20 or 10, 15 percent off, for example, for your first purchase. Mm -hmm. But your data is captured. No, but it's like anything with marketing, like it's not unethical in what it's doing until it becomes unethical, if you know what I mean. Like this is, a, it's fair enough if people know what's going on and where you're looking after that stuff well. But when you see these big data breaches where companies like Facebook or Instagram suddenly, yeah, oh, Cambridge accidentally, Analytica. well, yeah, I mean, not even that stuff. There's been several cases recently where they've accidentally given all the data that they were captured for something which was a particular purpose where they said, we're not going to spread this out. Um, and then it manages to find its way into an advertising thing where suddenly they're selling all that data to advertisers. And we're meant to be led to believe that this was just a mistake that, mm. you know, the best companies in the world with this sort of stuff accidentally put all that data into the wrong spreadsheet or whatever. And, you know, so those things are happening. But you sound a little bit cynical, Luke. Oh, very much so. Very much so. Well, I think Hopefully that can be the theme that comes across for today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We, we might lose our jobs. <laughs> but um, one of the things is, again, I, it's, yeah, some of, I think some of the time it's intentional, but governance around data, I don't think it's done very well, right down to employees, because employees do and can access data. So if they were to sell it, it's very difficult for a company to track unless they monitor that yeah, It takes that one leak to, it does. It's, it to does bump out a spreadsheet and then there you that go. information's everywhere. But it's not intention from the company and the brand. So I guess it's about governance around data and what does that mean and how do you really regulate that and how do you really protect consumer interests in that regard uh, and making sure that you know it's not predatory, it's not um, abusive, it's not intrusive as well. How do you do that? It's a big question out there for marketers to solve. Yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit more cynical. I think that it's aligned with <laughs> people respond and businesses respond to incentives and disincentives. And when the disincentive is we'll give you a fine of, you know, a billion dollars, but they've made five billion dollars off doing that, then it's like, well, of course they're going to keep doing it until we punish them more. Or But you've had some instances where I think the, the European Commission fined Google, uh, I can't remember exactly, but it was a lot was of a money, lot of money for competition billions, yeah. breaches over Google Shopping. So and the share price went up that same day, I believe, as well. Really? Granted that that stuff would have already been factored into sentiment for the share price, but again, doesn't doesn't have an impact because that's just it's just a cost of doing business for them. This is part of the process. And so even in the jurisdictions which find them the most, which have the strictest regulations and the most attack dog esque regulators, they're still getting off quite lightly. Well, considering everybody's googling every single day. Not me, man. Are you binging? No, no. No, there's Asking lots of other great Jeeves. ones. Duck, duck, go is oh, a great duck, one. Duck, go. Yeah. Yes, yes, I hear about that a lot. You can use Mozilla without, um, uh, yes. you know, their default is uh, Google search, but you can take that off as well. Yes. Well, but still, there's lots of great people. search engines out there as well that don't do the same things with your data. Yes, but it's not as good though. I don't. You can't yeah, get look, I can't we get got around without search duck, engines duck, before. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I you mean, had but, to use encyclopedias or something, or go to libraries. Yeah. Come on, it's 2019, man. You can man. still use Google Maps without having to go through Google search. Yeah, and... Fair enough. Hmm. But still, the data is captured. Yeah, to a degree. But if I've got an Android just... phone, it's still capturing all that data. Absolutely, yeah. Depending on what browsers you're using and things like I that. I'd like to see you not use Google for a I, year. I haven't used Google for a long time. Oh, I right. use Firefox, but... Yeah, Mozilla's a great one. Yeah. yeah. I still use Google search, though. Um, the... Actually, actually, th actually, this, this is a little interesting aside. The other day, I got an email uh, from Amazon. Is that interesting? Just that so you got an email? Or <laughs> well, no, I, I, I'll finish the story. I Thank can you forward very you much. as many as you I, like if you want. <laughs> I got an email CCs. from Amazon. And they said, because I, I, I subscribe to uh, I, uh, a certain audio book 
uh, subscription service. I won't name because that yep. would be unethical, but of course you know the one I'm talking about. It's the one everyone flogs on their podcast, but yeah. um, <laughs> but not on this one. <laughs> no. um, I got an email from them and said, hey, you can, um, you can, we'll, we'll send you a free smart speaker if you order mm, one. Yeah. Why? Why did they want? Why did they want to send me a free smart speaker in the mail? Because they wanted to hear everything that you were saying, and they, everyone else in your house, what they were saying, so they could serve you up some advertisements, and also so they could train, probably to train uh, their algorithms on the Australian accent. I would suggest is probably an area where they're going. So yeah, I mean, I think they cost them about ten million dollars to do all that sort of stuff, but you know, that's pocket change yep. compared to what they're going to get from it and the competitive advantage. So. Was I an idiot for ordering it and picking it up from the post office today, yesterday? Uh, maybe, am I, am maybe. I a naive moron for accepting something that was free, Luke? If I had to say one word, I'd say yes, but okay. that's your call. There's nothing wrong with being an idiot. We're all idiots for certain things. It's all right. <laughs> as long as we know what's going on, we're okay with that. I think it's fine. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure there will be some great inventions and things that will come out of these sorts of technologies. So it will help it, but at the same time. As long as At the same time, I've got a microphone in my room yes, the whole time. Yes, that's constantly I'm, recording. I wonder if, and I wonder if, well, you can mute it. I, can you, know, you though? You didn't see the can air you? quotes that I did, but uh, you can. <laughs> yeah. You can mute it. Um, and, oh, well, I'm helping. And when does it unmute? I'll help to train some some uh, robot at ASUS or uh, ASIO. Looking at physical stores, men, what are some of the new ways companies are getting us to buy? What are they going to be doing in the future? Well. I wish I have a crystal ball. I'll tell, talk <laughs> about the future. But I think currently... What is called the future of? So. Oh, well, I think, you know, Amazon, um, Alibaba, they use the jo just walk through technology, robotics, AI. And I think one of the things that you see is a lot of uh, integration between offline and online. So just mm. physical store itself is not going to work it. It's not going to cut it. So they have to integrate on it with an online platform. And this goes back to a lot of the t a time, you know, having access to data. I mean, just walk through technology essentially is just gathering data. You scan, you walk through, you pick up things, you walk out. It's understanding what people are buying and what is doing well and tracking that uh, and to pretty much know what products are doing well and what to stock up on and what to actually do your next promo, your next discount, your next catalog and next spam or, or spam to your email to entice you to click on that free thing button. And I think one of the things would be, uh, again, like with Alibaba Robotics in their, in their stores and having uh, a bigger experience, not just buying something, but actually having a dining experience in store that uses ro robots and you can order uh, and having menus. So all of these things are currently happening. I'm sure that at some point in time, it's probably going to continue. Um, so that's probably something that is happening, not just now, but probably in the future. And what do you see the store of the future looking like? Oh... I don't think it'll look that different. It probably to be won't. No. Well, or glass, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to have a retail store, you're going to have to provide something of value to go to that retail retail store. And we see a lot of shopping centres refurbing and um, you know trying to make more of an experience out of it and more entertainment and leisure based stuff. So I think we'll see a lot of that happening. Um, probably we will see more people going to a shopping centre or a store rather to select perhaps a product and they might not pick it up and take it home with them then. They might, um, that might be something that gets delivered at a later point or whatever it would be. Um, I think that will. That probably is, like people won't be carrying their goods out of the store. It will probably be buying on in store online and then delivered straight to their house. And you probably won't have um, customer service as in people, it would be robots or things that are self-service. And you'll probably see, um, you know, that people are in store for a different experience, not just to buy, but really maybe to interact or for entertainment value or for some other value that is probably not just for mm. there because they want to pick up, you know, that broccoli for dinner tonight. And when we think of robots, it's easy to think of the Jetsons and things zooming around, but I don't think that's how it will no. be. And Ikea, again, as an example, just having bought a couch from there. Um, but the idea that, um, like, we're interacting with robots, it, yeah, it seems like, we're, as I said, the Jetsons world, but what had a really great thing there was like this little virtual desk stand thing where I could go there and um, select on all the different couches that were there and then all the different configurations and put them all together in different ways and things like that. And I think that sort of technology is what we'll see happening more. Um, and obviously that being integrated with their supply chain management systems to know that this, like you could click on that and see this is on in stock now or it's in stock in, on Thursday or whatever it might be, as well as then clicking that through the person who works at the store can come through and then get a number off that, go to their desk, print it off with all the uh, inventory on there for you to then buy it online or whatever later. So that's, I think, where we'll see the technologies in robots. Like nobody's going to want to talk to a 
a robot cybernoid thing. Like people are still going to want to talk to people. And I think the more and more we see that stuff being forced on people, the more people will want to talk to people. And still, still a lot cheaper to pay someone twenty dollars an hour than it is to spend thousands of dollars on a robot. So. Oh, so like, how is Alibaba using robots? So I think a lot of the time when we think Alibaba, we think of, you know, the digital platform and, you know, online stores. But essentially they have a um, supermarket, a physical store, um, and they use robots. So, for example, if you want to dine in menus, you can just like order and it has like um, robots or r robotic devices to actually deliver to you. So that's what it what it does. Um, well, when we talk of robots, it doesn't have to be, you know, what we think of a human-like yeah. robot. Well, we've got robots at the self-serve checkout at our local Coles and Woolies. So, you know, it's yep, not, not Jetson-esque, but still no, absolutely, yeah. kind of annoying, but also cool as well. Yes, it's definitely. I mean, it's efficient, and I guess a lot of the time it's that um, it's about a, f a form of reduction of manpower mm. and labor and probably distributing that labor to other aspects of of a business rather than, you know, for other tasks that can be done by robots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's all uh, all quite interesting. The future is is coming at us fast and it's being built right here. Thank you very much, Min and Luke, Thank for you. sharing your knowledge on this topic. Thank you, Thank David. Thank you. Thanks for having us. You've been listening to The Future Of, a podcast powered by Curtin University. If you have any questions about today's topic, please feel free to get in touch by following the links in the show notes. Bye for now.